You know, every time you tap on your phone or get a search result, there's a whole hidden world humming along underneath. We're going to peel back those layers, starting with the absolutely massive machines that power our world from behind the scenes. Okay, so let's start with a bit of a puzzle. What kind of computer do you think it takes to predict a hurricane? And what about one that has to process billions of bank transactions every single day without ever messing up? You might think it's the same machine, right? Well, it's not. And the difference between them is absolutely fascinating. So let's meet them, the titans of computing. We're talking about mainframes and supercomputers. These are the giants running the world from behind the curtain, tackling problems and chewing through data on a scale that's almost hard to imagine. At the end of the day, the biggest difference between them comes down to why they were built. A mainframe is like the ultimate, most reliable workhorse. Its whole purpose is to juggle thousands of different tasks for thousands of different people all at the same time. A supercomputer, though, it's a completely different beast. It's a pure sprinter, built to pour every ounce of its incredible power into solving one single, monstrously complex problem as fast as possible. And this is where you can really see how different their jobs are. A mainframe is built to last for decades. Its fault tolerance is so high you can literally pull out a faulty processor and plug in a new one while it's still running. We measure its power in MIPS. Think of that as how many simple chores it can handle per second. But a supercomputer is all about flops. That's just raw, complex math power. It's so focused on speed that its lifespan is only about five years before it's replaced by the next faster thing. So you find these workhorses anywhere that failure is just not an option. We're talking about the backbone of our economy, banks processing all our transactions, governments counting every single person for a census. That's the mainframe's home turf. And the sprinters? Well, they get called in for the really big, hairy, complex challenges. We're talking about modeling our entire weather system, diving into the strange world of quantum mechanics, or unlocking the secrets of our DNA. These are the jobs that need every last drop of speed. All right, so we've got this amazing hardware, but how does it know what to do? How do we take a human idea and turn it into something a machine can actually understand? Well, that brings us to the invisible world of code translators. This bridge is something we call system software. You can think of it as the master control program, the manager of everything. It's the essential layer of code that lets all our apps and us actually talk to the physical hardware. And a huge part of that system are the translators themselves, compilers and interpreters. Imagine you have a book you need translated. A compiler is like a translator who takes the entire book, translates the whole thing at once, and then hands you the finished version. Reading that final book is super fast, but you only find out about any mistakes at the very end. An interpreter, on the other hand, is like having someone whispering the translation in your ear, line by line. It's slower, sure, but the second there's a problem, they stop. That makes it amazing for debugging. And you can see that compiler process right here. The programmer writes the code, the compiler does its big one-time translation, and boom, you get a standalone file that runs incredibly fast directly on the machine. Okay, let's zoom in one more level. Beyond the big system software, there's a whole digital maintenance crew working behind the scenes. These are the unsung heroes, the little utility programs that are constantly keeping your computer healthy, tuned up, and safe. You know that feeling when your computer just starts to feel sluggish over time? A lot of the time, this is why. It's called file fragmentation. As you use your computer, bits and pieces of a single file can get scattered all over the hard drive. So to open it, your computer has to run around like crazy, grabbing a piece from here and a piece from there, which really slows things down. The solution is actually pretty neat. Defragmentation. A utility program goes in and basically tidies up the whole drive. It gathers all those scattered pieces and puts them back together in a nice, neat row. Suddenly, your computer doesn't have to hunt for anything and it gets a whole lot faster. It's a simple but super effective digital tune-up. And of course, there's the security guard of this crew, your antivirus software. It's really clever using a three-pronged attack. First, it acts like a detective with a book of mugshots looking for the telltale signs of known viruses. Second, it does some profiling, looking for suspicious characteristics in new files. And third, it's a behavior analyst, just watching to see if any program starts doing something weird. It's a really smart, layered defense. So, wow, we've gone from these room-sized supercomputers all the way down to the tiny bits of code that keep your laptop healthy. So let's talk about the final layer, the one we actually see and touch every single day. Let's talk about how we communicate with our computers. 
For a long time, there have been two main ways to do this. You've got the command line interface, the CLI. Think of that classic hacker in a movie, typing green text on a black screen. It's super powerful, very efficient, but you have to know the exact commands. It's really for experts. And then you have what most of us use, the GUI, the graphical user interface. That's all your windows, icons, and your mouse pointer. It's way more intuitive for everybody, but it does take up more of your computer's resources. So just take a look at the phone or the laptop you're using right now. Which one is it? Yeah, for pretty much all of us, the GUI has become the default language we use to speak with all of our technology. And that really brings our whole journey full circle, doesn't it? We've gone from massive hardware that forms the backbone of our digital world, down through all those invisible layers of code that translate our ideas, all the way to the simple, intuitive screen that's sitting right in front of you. But the story is far from over. I mean, we've been pointing and clicking on icons for decades. But as computing weaves itself deeper into our world, into our cars, our homes, our glasses, that old model is starting to break down. So that leaves us with a really big question. What comes next? What's the interface we'll use when the computer itself has completely disappeared?